Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome to episode six of Game Retailer Ramblings. My name is Travis Severance. I'm coming to you live from Flower City in Rochester, New York today at the Millennium Game Studios, home of the largest game store in the United States. Today, we're going to have a conversation a little bit about the Gamma Trade Show that I was in Louisville, and then I'm going to talk about the TCG space and just really open it up as far as like what we're dealing with in that market, why the market's so crowded, how to be successful in that space, and talk about maybe some of the influencers that I look at and watch to make sure that I keep myself up to date with what's going on in that world because it's super, super busy. I had the chance to visit my fulfillment partner down in Corbin, Kentucky while I was there. These are the folks that put together the box for us for all the different publishers at Free RPG Day. So shout out to Jason and his team at WebSphere over there. The facility was amazing. They had some lovely fried chicken for us to eat for lunch. So I probably ate more than I should have. But I'm going to you know, walk my dogs a couple of extra times to try to get that off of my plate. Speaking of Free RPG Day, there are still a few kits left. Feel free to pop into www.freerpgday.com and grab a kit if you haven't grabbed one yet for your retail store. Gamma. Really brief on Gamma. So Gamma was moved from its former location, the Pepper Mill, to the new location at the Kick, which is the Kentucky Convention Center. Every time there's a move like this, there's a little bit of jostling and people sort of figuring out where the party's going to be and where the party isn't and setting up meeting times is always a little bit challenging and things like that. This was an interesting show for me. I would say that I was busy most of the time that I was awake between meetings for the retail store, meetings for game design, meetings for free RPG day, meetings for a consultation, meetings for other potential companies that I'm working with. Very, very busy show. It's it's sort of always that way. As far as the new location goes, I think the new location worked just fine. Louisville isn't a hub town, so it's difficult to travel there until it gets into a location like, you know, Chicago or a Dallas or something like that. Atlanta, maybe. We're going to always deal with traveling complexities when you're flying in from basically anywhere. Location wasn't bad. I think part of the challenge for what we dealt with at the location is a lot of times B2B meetings is kind of the straw that stirs the drink for it. It's a, it's a show where retailers come in and take a look at what publishers have to offer. They can get an idea of what the catalog looks like for them for maybe the first half of the year, not the second half. Really, we get to see the second half of the year, usually around Gen Con, but it gives you an idea of what the publisher is bringing to the table for spring, summer, and it sort of sets you up for that convention season. And then you move from there. A lot of what takes place, though, at that show is more businesses meeting with other businesses, retailers meeting with those businesses to have conversations about the future. And that foundational work sort of sets the table for maybe the next 12 months. And a lot of times, at least for me, the meeting cycle goes New York Toy Fair when it's in February, Gamma. Then there's a follow-up conversation that takes place at Gen Con. And then occasionally there's a follow-up conversation that takes place at PAX Unplugged. So those are sort of the three shows that are triangulated for me where I set the table for my business on a quarterly basis. One challenge with the location was just getting back and forth between the Galt and the Kick. There was a couple of streets there and a couple of different lights. And what happened was everybody sort of had their own meeting space. If you were in the Galt, then getting to the Kick took 15 minutes or so, depending on the lights and things. And if you were at the convention space, it was the same thing. So... Maybe we were just spoiled in the pepper mill, but we got to have everybody kind of collapsed into one specific area. Yes, there was labyrinthian nature to the casino and different things and finding where the pocket rooms were, but we were all essentially under one roof, and that just wasn't the case at this new location. And from talking with other vendors, too, it feels like the organization has some challenges with regard to communication in different ways. I know we ran into an issue where we thought we were supposed to present to some publishers and for whatever reason that wasn't the case. So we prepared for a a 10 minute slideshow and and an introduction thing that didn't take place. So somewhere along the line, there was some sort of miscommunication, some sort of breakdown there. I know I spoke with a publisher whose coupon wasn't in the book and there was some different things going on. So I I think talking to some of the people inside of Gamma, they're going to go about trying to address that moving forward and being able to have some direct conversations and knowing exactly who you should go to for what things. I've done that side of the world before. I know there's a lot of people wearing a lot of different hats and there's new staff coming in, so there can definitely be challenges when it comes to that. And then the other side of things, it feels like from previous years and maybe not last year, but definitely the years before, there were a lot more retailer to retailer 
conversations that were happening, a lot more seminars, a lot more retailer to retailer education. I think there was less than 30 hours this year. And given that they were in, you know, five hour increments, that's not a lot of conversation from retailer to retailer. I know the premier presentations and the people wanting those slots have definitely gone up and those are paid slots versus the retailer to retailer slots. So I think fundamentally for the show, the reason why I went to the show and the reason why the show was important for me early on when I was a younger retailer was exactly that sitting in retail to retailer seminars where there's somebody up in front of me with an acumen in an area that I don't have that's educating me how to become a better retailer and then having follow-up conversations at the meals and things like that. And it just didn't feel like the catalog was filled with as many as those there had been previously. I know that there's some um, Gamma Board retailer elections coming up on Thursday. So maybe there'll be some changes there and there'll be a different focus for the organization. Aside from that, though, I think for a transition year and things like that, yeah, there were some companies that were missing. They made some choices there. But overall for the show, as far as a B2B show, it worked out great. I got to do the things that I needed to do. I got to talk to the people that I needed to talk to. The questions that I had going into the show were mostly answered. And, you know, I left with a little bit over 120 business cards that I needed to follow up with as far as communication goes after the show, because I spent two days working the booth for free RPG day. The show hall was bigger than it normally is. How many of those publishers I'm going to then see next year will be always the question. The show floor was, was significantly larger. So there was, it took a little bit longer to wander around, but I wait until the last day to do that because most of the retailers at that point had stopped going into the hall. So I got to have some great conversations and some good follow-up, and it's allowed me the opportunity to reach out to publishers that I wouldn't normally get a chance to. And the nice thing is now it feels like everybody has some sort of a direct purchasing model, so I don't have to track down a distributor or something like that. I can place a spot order with them. They'll ship me the stuff. I've got that relationship. And then if it works out and it goes 100 new, 100 new publishers that I have to do one of spot orders is not going to work long term. But it's okay if I'm placing one order that's sort of loading up on that line to figure out what it is. And then the reality of it is after that, I I move to one or two things. Either move to, I'll take a look at how that line did 30 days or 60 days out and see if it makes sense to place another direct order. Or the next step for me realistically is to just change them in my POS to restock through the distribution. And then I try to order that product from distribution. So that's that's typically the way that I handle that. I like to set up the direct relationship so they know who I am. And if there's any other special things that they have going on or promotions or things like that, I can be able to go down through that with them and figure out a little bit more about their line or what they specifically are trying to sell. Because sometimes I show up at those booths and they've got like 30 or 40 products that I'm not familiar with. And not to say that I'm shy about ordering 30 to 40 products, because I'm certainly not. But I want to know what your greatest hits are and things like that. And based on the meetings that I had, I didn't have a heck of a lot of time to get downstairs to sit through seminars and have those conversations. The the, acous- the acoustics in the rooms, in these new rooms that are a little bit tinier, didn't feel like they were as good. So if there was a single complaint about the location, aside from it feeling like it was split between two shows, is maybe just the acoustics in those rooms was a little bit rough. Other than that, though, great show. I had a good time. I got to talk to a lot of people that I really enjoy seeing at the industry. I got to have some good conversations with new publishers, a handful of conversations with retailers. A number of people came up to me and said that they're really enjoying the videos. That's great. I'm obviously not doing this as my part of my retirement plan. So it's good to hear that that people are enjoying the show and they're finding value in it. In fact, I had one publisher that gave me one of the strongest compliments that I got there. And they said, I, I listened to what you're talking about in the show. And what I find myself is I'm agreeing with about 90% of what you're saying. And then there's another 10% that I that I disagree with, but then I catch myself later in the day thinking about (laughs) that 10% that I disagree with, should I be agreeing with you? So if what's the conversation that's happening here is, is thought provoking enough to make people consider what they're doing in their business. I, I can't beat that as far as what I'm trying to do here. You know, whether it's a retailer, whether it's a publisher, whether it's a distributor thinking about the way that they're doing business, like that's about as best as, as good as I can get. So I'll I'll wrap up Gamma with that, and we'll talk about the TCG market a little bit today. Can it get any bigger? The answer is yes, it's going to get any bigger. I really hope it does get bigger because it feels like the CCG market has just expanded a ton. The big three have done a great job of, of bringing a lot of eyeballs in to 
CCGs in general. I think COVID had a lot of impact on the number of people that are interested in playing card games. I think the Hearthstone, Legends of Runeterra, Marvel Snap, that sort of st- those sort of games are really, really good about onboarding people into understanding what a collectible card game is, even if they're in the digital space. And I would say the same for Magic Arena and the Yu-Gi-Oh! platform as well. So there's a, there's a whole ton of card players out there that just weren't there before. And what we're seeing in our store, currently we're running 12 unique weekly card game events in terms of brands. So we run Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Pokemon, UVS, Star Wars Unlimited, Digimon, One Piece, Dragon Ball Fusion, Shadowverse, Flesh and Blood, Cardfight Vanguard, and Lorcana. We have run events for Sorcery and Battle Spirits this year. We have a large Keyforge event that's coming up as well. We've sold Weiss, we've sold Final Fantasy, we've sold Grand Archive, we'll carry Altered, and we're going to bring in Union Arena as well. So all told, in active collectible card games that we're engaging in business in some level, that's 20. Um, when I started working here, there was a handful of games that were going on, but at the, at the most, maybe we had six to eight at a time. So it's sort of an embarrassment of riches. And there's a couple of different ways that you can divide up these TCGs that are on the market. The big three are the big three. You know, Magic, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! Those are sort of the straw that stirs the drink around here. Magic, despite what it's gone through uh, and what's happening with the market and such, it's still going to be the game that sort of sets the standard for what we're doing in store. It's always the highest selling game in store, and it's always the highest selling singles in the store, where last year it wasn't the most profitable game. If I look at net dollars and I look at gross revenue for the game, it's still light years ahead of everybody else. Pokemon sort of trailed behind a little bit, and then Yu-Gi-Oh! sort of did its thing. The Bandai Card Gamer is a real category, a customer now. They have managed to figure out a formula that says their fans that like the properties that they're dealing with will take a look at their games and they'll play their games. They sort of onboard them and then they offboard them with the next title that comes along. There's a handful of issues that they're dealing with now when it comes to the market. Digimon itself comes out now and it's day one zero. And what I mean by day one zero is... When you take a look at the marketplace and and, and you use TCG sort of as your guidepost, the day of launch, the game has already almost gotten itself to at cost or below cost, which makes it a really difficult game to continue to try to sell if you're a market price store. We're a market price store. We market price based on volume, and I take a wide approach when it comes to inventory and not a lot of depth unless I really believe in something. There's a handful of games right now that there's no amount of product that would be enough for me. I'm looking at one piece specifically. So going back to the day one dead conversation, there are games that we carry where the pre-release and the pre-order phase is basically the only place that we make. Uh, we make the lion's share of our revenue on that. After that, it's just pack sales because box sales get to the point where they're so far below what we need to make in order to make it sustainable, that it doesn't make sense long-term to continue to hold that inventory. And the singles in those boxes are not worth the value of the cost of those boxes to continue to maintain. So we take a shorter a shorter investment approach on those. We try to figure out what we're gonna need to sell within the first 30 days of launch. We play with the numbers a little bit on that, but most of it's based off of pack sales after day one. So games that are day one dead at this point are Digimon, Shadowverse, Cardfight Vanguard, Yu-Gi-Oh! We got rid of Battle Spirits. Weiss can be this way if you're not selling it by the case. A Grand Archive is something that we chose not to carry, but we do handle some pre-orders for that, and the same thing with Final Fantasy. And a lot of that is just due to the speculative buying just not being a thing that matters, and for whatever reason, when you see product that does that and it just craters on launch, a lot of times the reason is it's just overprinted or they're printing beyond the market of player that's actually in existence. They need to do a better job of sort of gating supply or taking a more mature approach to it. There are Pokemon products that are day one dead, but not as many. Magic is rarely day one dead, although Karlov, it was day one <laughs> below below cost. So I think the difference between the ones that I mentioned early on in, in a, a card game like Magic or Pokemon is that Magic and Pokemon have a wide enough market space where they can actually get themselves out of it. Holding on to Magic, 
is okay. It can rebound. There's a lot of times when, you know, we deal with this huge amount of people that in the market decide that they need to recoup the investment on everything that they had because they're either a pre-order based business or they're a singles based business. or they're both, they lean on both of those things. So they're just trying to recoup whatever's left over for their sealed product as fast as they possibly can. So a lot of times the magic curve is kind of this drop and then it comes up. If you take a look at some of the newer product or the product in the last two years, you'll see that some of that stuff has started to rebound despite concerns about pricing issues for the new stuff, different issues with some of the universes beyond products, things like that. It will bounce back. You just have to have enough. You have to be in a financial position to be able to hold long enough for it to do that, or you have to look at modifying what you're doing. What usually happens is when retailers or online sellers realize that the market is flat or the market's starting to tank on the sealed product, what they try to do is they try to gas pedal singles a lot of times, so they shred, 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 shred. Those get all posted up on TCG Player or wherever they are locally, and that crashes the market even further because the value of the boxes ends up going down even more because there's more singles that are out that are available, and there's less hits in those packs. So it takes a little while for that to flush out and sort of come back. So you have to be patient for it. The, the downside to that is in, in a state like New York, I pay taxes based on what my inventory value is that I have. So if it's closer towards the end of the year, liquidation is the best thing for me to do to not pay taxes on that thing unless I think the rebound is going to happen so quickly that it outpaces what I'm going to pay on taxes. So Q4 for us is a lot of looking around, gardening what I have, figuring out what an investment product looks like versus something that I should just liquidate and turn into capital so that I can use that. So the fact that Karlov tanked in the beginning of the year for me because of the way that things work for our business in the state that I'm in is actually good. I can hold that for a little bit longer. If Karlov tanked and it was October, then I'd really be looking at what am I going to do? How am I going to get myself underneath this position that I have for this? So it's a bit, it's 100% the stock market game. It's the largest volume purchasing that we do here. It's it's collectible in nature. So there's going to be fluctuations for that. There's plenty of stores out there that just hold the line on keystoning and they only bring in what they think they're going to sell and so on and so forth. And there's definitely days when we're dealing with, you know, hundreds and thousands and sometimes millions of dollars that we're trying to navigate ourselves around where <laughs> the idea of just bringing in 12 boxes and selling them for full MSRP and moving on is is, is an attractive idea for me. It just... I've got 43 employees that I have to take care of and make sure that they're still getting paychecks every day. So I have to run the business in a little bit of a different way. So that said, I'm thrilled with those, with that amount of games. I love having the diversity. I'm at a, I'm at a space where we've got, we can fit 300 card players in the space. So there are nights of the week when we're running five or six different tournaments. Part of the value to that is that if somebody gets disincentivized to play a game or they're they're just not into whatever it is, they can turn to the left or they can turn to the right and they can see a brand new card game on the table that maybe is attractive to them. So then I still continue to retain that customer. I still have somebody that's looking at uh, card games in my location that they may find attractive. There's new stuff that's coming out too. A Star Wars Unlimited, I, I really, I, I did my best with this game after I spent some time working with them and talking with them about what their plans were for the game. I really did my best to try to let as many people in my retail sphere know that this game was going to matter and that it's this is a different FFG and it's a different Asmodee that's dealing with a card game brand. And there were a ton of people that poo-pooed based on history and ah, I don't know how they're going to manage this game and they don't know how to handle a CCG and their only experience is UVS and different things like that. Star Wars Unlimited has been great. Star Wars Unlimited is going to continue to be great. Star Wars Unlimited is going to probably hold serve pretty well for at least the next two to three years, which out of the gates, that's great. The reality of it is the lifespan of most games that are in my store that are successful doesn't eclipse the three-year span very often occasionally it does but most of the time it doesn't most card games get to zero pretty quickly that's why you know outside of magic uvs pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, there isn't anything that's more than 10 years old in the store and we've carried hundreds of ccgs in the history of the store so that's a bit about pricing and a bit about the approach i think one of the benefits to the number of games on the market right now is the level of difficulty to get competency. There's a lot of companies out there that have identified that the younger generation wants to feel success quicker. 
So there are games that are a little bit more easy to kind of deconstruct to know what the proper play is to play. The the space itself has, you know, good entry level products. It's got good medium thinky products. It's got some good high level thinky games as well. The LCG space is another space with a whole bunch of card games that that can really get your brain going. So what's happening in my estimation is that the the evolution of the players' minds in the CCG space right now has kind of cranked itself up a little bit. So there's more people playing more games. They understand more of the fundamentals and the more of the mechanics. And the opportunity to be able to deep dive into something a little bit different isn't nearly as scary as it used to be. And onboarding isn't as challenging outside of something like One Piece, which for whatever reason, they're just not printing enough of, whether it's strategically or it's just the way that it has to work for a company that's producing five or six CCGs at this point. And doing pretty well with, with, with a good amount of them. But, you know, we're, we're at my company. I would probably back off the Digimon printing a little bit and go a little short on that and add some of that to the One Piece printing if that was something that they could do. And I would say the same about Battle Spirits as well. With Union Arena coming in, I don't expect it to get better. You know, I'm already seeing allocations on the new Dragon Ball Fusion set, which is frustrating. But the interesting thing that happened at Gamma was Union Arena was announced as something that Peach State Hobby is going to be dis- distributing now. Now, Peach State is somebody that I work with on a on a lot of games, but they they don't have they haven't had distribution rights in the in the U.S. yet. They have Koki distribution, which is South America, so they handle all of Bandai's distribution in South America. They know that area really really well, and then they also handle Bliss distribution, which is a U.K. distributor, and they handle Bandai over there as well. This is the first product line that PhD is allowed to sell to the U.S. in the Bandai catalog. Now, maybe that means down the road that there'll be another one that's allowed to sell one piece so it won't just be GTS and Alliance selling it. I'll have the opportunity to order from a third place. But the fact that they have Union Arena, maybe it's a proving ground for them or maybe it's their opportunity to see if they can do something to move the needle for that game. I'm encouraged by it. The more sales outlets, the more opportunity, the more relationships that I have. And when it comes to collectible product, Trying to do it exclusively ends up being hard when you get to a certain point of growth and maturity in the game. There's just not enough ways to get the product out that you need. So I'm going to really quickly touch on seven influencers that keep me informed in TCG world. So I can't read every article. I can't go to every place. I can't go to every site. I can't watch every video. I can't. It's just not possible. So what happens when I'm at my house, honestly, is uh, YouTube is on more than any other channel. And YouTube typically has one of these seven influencers that's sort of giving me some information in the background, at least while I'm doing things, to keep me up to date on what's going on in the CCG community based on the things that I carry. Number seven, M. Cole 40. Robbie is a madman. He posts like five, six, seven, sometimes 25 different videos a day, all Yu Gi Oh! based. So anything and everything that you want, speculation, factual information, whatever, you know, they're usually five to 10 to 15 minute videos unless he's doing a super deep dive on something. So when it comes to volume for Yu-Gi-Oh! for somebody to listen to that's plugged in really well, M. Cole 40, give him a follow, a uh, good guy. And he has something about whatever topic you want to you wanna look at in the Yu-Gi-Oh! space. Really quick hit videos, things like that. To keep in mind too, after this video when we go when we shut down i'm gonna do i'll go live with a 10 minute ama to catch up with some of the questions that people have in chat as well number six and these aren't in any order satonis tim keefe he covers uvs he's been a uvs player for a long long time he's got three or four cards that are actually his from winning different championships he's covered a touch of altered as well and his uvs stuff is just a a really nice breakdown format of you want to get yourself caught up on current events in UVS and what's going on with the game and what's going on with their OP and what's going on with products. Quick, simple, easy videos that are just on the nose. He gives you a rundown of what the video is going to be about. So if you look at the video and you go, okay, I don't care about any of those topics, you can just move along. But he presents it in a really nice black and white way. The Professor Brian Lewis, number five, Tolarian Community College. Gosh, he's been covering stuff for a long, long time. Most of the time, it's magic. Sometimes somebody gives him a couple of dollars and he covers something else and does a really nice job with that. He has a great brand, a lot of videos, good quality stuff. And I give the guy props. He did a video a little while back that was 
a video about the worst videos he ever did. And he explained business-wise why he wanted to do it a different way or what mistakes he made when it came to those type of videos and why. So I, I love somebody that will drag themselves out in the street and kick themselves a little bit because it shows an ability to be introspective when it comes to certain things and admit to mistakes and, and show your own personal growth. Number four is Eggman. I don't know what his real name is. His real name is just Eggman to me. He primarily covers Bandai card games. So he does deep dives and rundowns of all the high-level Bandai card games that are out there from all the big tournaments. He deconstructs the deck list. Occasionally he has some people on to talk specifically with winners. He has a live stream that goes on. He's affiliated with one of the stores. So a lot of times there, there's a game that you can watch him in the Twitch space or he goes live on YouTube, does a really, really nice job getting you up to speed on whatever the new game is. He'll do entire videos on the different colors for the new Dragon Ball game, and he'll handle, he handles stuff outside of that too, depending on who he talks with. There was a UVS video that he did a little while back, sort of introducing some of the set mechanics for that. So he does a great job. And number three is Louis over at Kitchen Table TCG. He's a retailer they work with a lot of different card games. There's a podcast that's affiliated with that as well. A lot of times his videos are talking about things that are specific in the market. He was somebody that invested really heavily into sorcery the way that we did and did a whole bunch of pack openings and sorcery is really exciting for him. And then he's got a, a, a couple of other hosts that he brings on for their podcast and they talk about mostly magic. A lot of times it's commander stuff, but there's a, a, a ton of stuff that he talks about that he's dealing with inside of the retail space that's valuable to me. Sometimes it's just nice to hear somebody talking about the same trouble and the same challenges that I'm dealing with. I, I enjoy that side of it. He has a really nice casual approach. Really, really good guy. Number two, I got Crush Cards. That's Brian and Logan. They do the highest quality videos for Yu-Gi-Oh! content that you'll find in the world. Their videos are amazing. They shoot really, really well. They deep dive all kinds of stuff. They do box openings. They do deck lists. They break down metas. Sometimes they're live at, at, at a different tournament or a high-level tournament. They've been in the community for a long time. Tons of followers. But the amount of time and the dedication and the quality that they put into their videos is hard to find in any of the game industry space. So feel free to get on Crush Cards, give them a like, and then take a look at some of their videos. And then number one for today is Alpha Investments which I kind of stole his name. So today's episode was Beta Investments. This is Rudy. He's sort of infamous in, in retail circles. There's a ton of people years ago that watched Rudy's stuff and Rudy kind of trashed on retail or trashed on local game stores and people got really unenthusiastic about whatever he's ax grinding about at the current time or he doesn't know or he doesn't understand this or that or the other thing. He has certainly matured. He's certainly grown. He understands his brand. He knows who he is as a person. He memes himself. He's got throwaway lines that are in there. He's pretty well plugged in. From an investment side of things, the way that he looks at the market is not dissimilar to the way that I look at the market when it comes to a lot of things. He's honestly just doing it with a lot bigger a lot bigger bag, as the kids would say these days. He's going at it with, a, with an aggressive financial approach. He's got a Patreon account that's attached to that that you can get some benefits from. I reached out to him for a shirt. He never reached back. It's okay. I don't hold it against him. He's a very busy guy. He's not always right, but he always has something compelling to say. So if you tuned him out because he was a little too bro-ish for you before, I would encourage you to go in and take a look at some of the videos that he's doing now, where he's at in the industry as far as his thinking, while I don't speculate in the same way that he does, is pretty quality. And then honorable mention for me would be Dan from the main deck. Dan's a great guy. I got to play Altered with him in Paris phenomenal content. Dan essentially covers everything that everybody else isn't. So if there's a new game coming out or you've never really heard of anything or you don't know where to look for content, Dan probably has a video up. Really, really nice guy from the Northwest. It just just wholesome and, and good content and does really good stuff. He's, he's done a lot of Star Wars Unlimited content. He's done a lot of altered content. There's a whole bunch of different things that he's talked about in that realm. So he's another good guy. So we're going to wrap it up for today. Please hit the like or subscribe button if you can. We'll be back next week. Same GER time, same GER channel. Take care, everybody.